-hmm. So good morning, everybody. So I'm going to kick things off. Um, I've got quite the crew here today. So I'm going to start off by, uh, we're going to be talking about scams today. This is something uh, that Duty to Intervene and some different programs are working on, but this is something that you kind of requested, you folks requested. So keep those suggestions and ideas coming so we can uh, better serve you and get the information to you that you need. So I'm very pleased to have with us today uh, three members of our detective bureau. So we have uh, Detective Payne, Detective Monteverdi, and obviously you all know uh, Chip Dapolite. He's our he's also part of the detective unit, and he's our school resource official. So what what I decided early on when I took over just over five years ago. Um, Chip was on a four and two schedule in uniform. What I decided to do, and at the time, uh, it's very accepted now, but I wanted a softer approach in the school, so he had the opportunity to wear plain clothes uh, and to interact. So he's been doing a fine job, and I'm really pleased to report, I know you probably saw in the news today, the Shrewsbury Varsity Girls Hockey Team won the state championship last night. But what people don't know is, is it's Westboro Shrewsbury. So, so we sent, a bunch of cruisers to escort them as they came back from Boston. Uh, so, you know, very proud of our athletic programs. Uh, Chip's very involved with it as well as Detective uh, Monteverdi. So, I'm going to skip out um, early today. The reason why we had a change uh, in speakers is uh, we're on the accelerated version for accreditation. Uh, I think I shared with you last month we are certified now, we're on the fact track to be fully accredited. Uh, and they're assessing us the next three days. So it's, it's really, a, it's a big deal and it's all hands on deck with that. And again, it's best practices, our policy and procedures, five years ago from the 80s and now we have departments across the Commonwealth calling Westboro asking for our policies and procedures because we're the first department that's certified under version six, which meets all the post requ requirements. That's the Police Officers Standards and Training Commission. So it really is a big deal, uh, putting Westboro on the map, and I can't thank my entire team enough for all the hard work that they've done uh, to make sure we, we got this done, we got this program in place. And if you watch the last select board meeting, um, we actually went and we gave a presentation on safety net, which is something that Officer Sabati, who's also here today, is going to be presenting to you. It's basically uh, technology that finds lost people, could be someone with dementia, could be someone that uh, is on the spectrum. So we're going to be rolling that out uh, to you folks and all has been great, very supportive um, with funding and really planning that with us. So and, and it came from Selectman Shelby Marshall who had an issue with a family member of hers. She brought this technology to our attention. And like I always say, you know, we love suggestions. And this is basically, it's great technology. If you remember LoJack for stolen vehicles, this is basically LoJack for stolen people. Of lost people, not stolen, lost people. So uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I'm going to be taking off to deal with um, the accreditation work that we have uh, before us, and hopefully uh, very soon I'm going to be able to say we're now the first department in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 351 cities and towns, all these colleges and universities, and Westboro PD will be the first department fully accredited under this plan, which really is a testament uh, to, to your offices, the hard work, uh, that, that they do every day. So without further ado, and I will figure out what next month will be. It will be something very entertaining. Uh, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to these good folks, uh, and they're going to entertain you and answer any question that you have. Thank you, Chief. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Chief already introduced me, and I know most of you here. Um, just some background about myself. I've been a police officer since 1999, full-time on the Westboro Police Department. Before that, I was part-time, uh, dating back to 95. Uh, I grew up in the town of Westboro, so I understand a little bit more about the community. I actually moved back here to raise my family. So that's enough about me. Just want to give you some background so you understand that you know, I kind of know what's going on in town. But also, growing up in town gives me a different perspective being a police officer. It helps a lot. Uh, the way I just want to let you know, too, is the way I talk, I'm, I'm Italian, so I use my hands a little bit. I really don't like this microphone. Uh, it, it bothers me because I can't use my hands more. And I do walk around quite a bit, so if I get too close or something like that, you think I'm too close, you just shoot me away. Um, I get to start off talking about some scams that you'll see. The first scam that we're going to talk about is called a computer repair scam. Somebody might call, call you up 
and out of the blue say, I noticed you have a virus. Actually, they first start off saying, I noticed your computer's running slow. Now, I've had computers run slow all the time. You buy a brand new computer, as soon as you put programs on it, it starts to slow down a little bit. So, how many people here have a laptop or some sort of computer that they use? Okay, just about everybody. You may get that phone call. Hey, your computer's running slow, isn't it? The actual response is yes. Well, they're just taking a shot in the dark. You know, you can even just say, well, I just got a brand new computer. But the next thing they'll say to you is, oh, well, does it have virus protection? And it's very interesting. So we know what virus protection is. Anybody here have virus protection on the computer? I can tell you if you bought a computer that's running Windows, everybody already has virus protection. Windows automatically updates that all the time. So if somebody calls and offers you virus protection, just say, thank you, I'm all set. Hang up the phone. I know we like talking to people. I know we like having a conversation with somebody. And being polite is very important too. But when it comes to your money, you can be a little bit rude. Because the next thing you're gonna say is, well, your computer's running slow. If you give me a credit card, I can install a program on your computer that will get rid of all your viruses and have your computer run fantastic. That sounds almost too good to be true. And guess what? It is. Now don't get me wrong, there's some legitimate virus scans. Uh, you can go out and buy Norton I think North 360 used to have a good virus scan. But nowadays, you don't need to do it. To have, I'm a computer geek, just to let you know, I've had computers all my life. I can tell you that you don't really need an extra virus protection now. If you have a Mac, uh, which is an Apple product, those are almost in person. You cannot even get a virus with those. Uh, if you have a Windows-based computer, that comes now with virus protection. So if somebody says, I need your credit card, and what they do is they'll initially charge you, but then they'll tell you it's a yearly plan, and they'll keep charging you. Do not ever, unless you made the attempt, say a pipe burst, and the plumber called, and you're get, trying to get your pipes fixed, and he does a great job, and you give him a credit card on the phone. I get that. But never give somebody you don't know your credit card number, your bank information, your social security number, your date of birth. Yeah, you can get that stuff online. We get that. But we're not going to make it easier for them to scam you. And when somebody calls up and says, your computer's running slow, say, yeah, it is, but I'm all set. I know my, I have virus protection already. And just hang up the phone. There are many other scams besides computer scams. Uh, computer scams are one of the easier ones that they do because they call you up and they want, and like I said, they know that they have you, because everybody's computer runs slow after a certain amount of time. But just tell them politely, no thank you, my computer's all set, hang up the phone. They might call back, do the same thing, hang up the phone. They can be persistent. When it gets to harassment though, they keep calling and calling. A legitimate business will not keep calling and bugging you. They won't. They'll ask you one time, Hang up the phone. If you ever have a question of whether a business is legitimate or not, or maybe something, you can always call the police department. You can ask a neighbor, ask a friend, ask a relative. Have you ever heard of this company? And that does help out a lot. But there's a whole variety of scams. And I just touched on just that one quick one. Uh, Detective Monteverdi has another one that he'll tell you about, an IRS scam. <clears throat> First off, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Detective Monteverdi. Uh, it's a little bit about myself. I know Detective Napoli talked about himself a little bit, but this is my sixth year with the Westboro Police Department. I've just about finished up one year with the Detective Bureau. All I can say about that is that it's a completely different job from when you work patrol. I'm still learning every day, but uh, I love the position I'm in, and that's why I'm here to talk to you today. So I know uh, Detective Napoli talked about the computer virus scam. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the IRS scam. So. A lot of times, so your social security number is the most important thing that you have in your life, right? I think we can all agree on that. So what they do with this scam normally is they'll call you on their phone. Sometimes they'll disguise their number 
where it comes up when you call her ID as maybe the IRS hotline, social security services, something like that, where you see that come up on your phone, you're probably gonna wanna answer it right away. More often times than not, the government is not gonna do any business over the phone with you. If your social security card or your number has been compromised, they're not gonna call you to tell you that. So when you pick up the phone, they'll ask you to confirm some personal information, and then after that, they'll say, hey, we can make this all go away, However, what's your bank account number? And they'll make you pay X amount of money in order to make everything go away with it. So as far as that goes with the IRS scams, just remember, the government is never gonna call you more often times than not to fix those types of issues. So the way to avoid that is say, no thanks, I'm all set, just hang up the phone. There's no issue with that and no problem with that at all. So, that's the best way to avoid that. And uh, with that being said, I'll probably pass the microphone off to Detective Payne, who's going to speak about the U.S. Marshal scam. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not Italian, so I'm going to use the podium. <laughs> um, my name's Dean Payne. I've been with the Westboro Police Department for just about 16 years now. And with the investigations for uh, coming up on five years. <coughs> So this morning I'll talk to you guys about the uh, grandchild in jail scheme. Um, is everyone familiar with that? Everyone heard about that? Everyone have grandchildren? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, the first thing I can assure you is that if you do have a family member in jail, whether it's a grandchild or a child or anyone else, you will not be getting a phone call from the agency that your family member was arrested by you'll be getting a phone call from that individual him or herself for bail money uh, police departments don't make bail calls for the people that they've arrested so if that happens that you know that should be the first indicator if it's someone saying that they're representing an agency that has arrested a family member of yours just hang up the phone and um does, does everyone have a cell phone nowadays or does any or let me ask this does anyone still answer their home phone yeah. okay uh, if if they call a cell phone and that's the way most people uh, communicate these days it's very easy you can just block that phone number from coming through to your cell phone again most likely the people pulling the scheme will have another number that they'll call you from but you just keep blocking those phone numbers and eventually they'll give up on you and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but you know, the long story short is, it's real simple. Uh, government does not do business over the phone like that. So if you get a phone call from a government agency saying that they need your personal information or they need money, hang it up. Um, everything done by the government is well documented as we all know and you'll be getting a letter or maybe an email and a letter but it won't be simply by a phone call and if you start getting threats don't don't be afraid to call the police department um, sometimes we can get lucky and we're able to maybe get a lead or two based on the phone number that you received the call from that we can look into and then try to um, respond appropriately to that so um, does anyone have any questions about the grandchild in jail scheme do they ever ask for gift cards yeah so uh, one, one, one thing one way that they'll ask for payment for the bail is they'll ask you to go to say Target or Walmart or stop and shop CVS any any store that sells gift cards and most likely they'll tell you to go there get a specific gift card google google pay card is the one that's very popular they'll ask you to purchase that and put a certain amount of money on it whether it be five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars after you purchase that card they'll tell you to either call them back if they haven't demanded that you stay on the phone with them which they will sometimes do as well they'll have you flip the card over the back side there's a protected number on the back you can scratch off and it gives a serial number or a code 
they'll have you read that code to them. And then once that's done, then the back of that card is scratched. That card is no longer good to you. And they'll use that number to access the money that you just paid for the card with. So that, that's one way that they'll steal from you. Any others? Yes? I just wanted to give you an example. My sister works at Walmart in Worcester. One gentleman came up and bought two five hundred dollar gift cards. Then he went to check on them. They were already wiped clean. Not even three minutes went by and those that thousand dollars from those two different gift cards were totally wiped clean and they were gone. They didn't have to scratch any numbers, they didn't have to talk to anybody or nobody was on the phone with them, but yet they lost that thousand dollars in approximately three minutes after he paid for it and he went to check and the money was gone. Yeah, um, they're, they're quick. They're good at what they do for sure, which is unfortunate because it just makes everyone else a victim. Um, you know, one, one thing I did fail to mention is that um, if you do get that phone call, if if you think there's a chance it might be legitimate, ask for a return, ask for a phone number that you can call back. You can hang up the phone. You can call, you can try calling the family member that's allegedly been arrested or, you know, that, that grandchild's parents or whatever. And you can try to verify that way through people that you know whether um, someone's been arrested or not. And if, if it is legitimate, then the people that called you will gladly provide you with a phone number to call them back at. If it's not, they're gonna put pressure on you to try to stay on the phone. And they'll make threats that if, if you hang up and try to call back, that that's gonna somehow eliminate the possibility of bail and that your grandchild will be staying in jail. So um, just keep that in mind. Yes, sir. I found the best way to avoid these scams, if you don't know that phone number, don't answer it. Oh, that's an excellent point. Um, you know, if, if it's a phone number that shows up that you're not familiar with, absolutely, let it go to voicemail. And if it's important, they'll, they'll leave you a message. So uh, that's an excellent point, thank you. Yes, ma'am? Is there any way that we can educate the stores more? Because I got, I know what he's saying, if you don't recognize the phone number, but I had a, I did get scammed. They wanted uh, five $100 cards. But the person they contacted me with was my best friend. So I didn't even question that anything was up because it was their number that I had a program. So my whole conversation with this other person thought was with them. Yeah. And I did that. When I went to the store, I found out later that the stores are supposed to ask you because they have to, every two, you can only buy two cards. And then a manager has to come over and approve it for you to buy more or even just to approve it. And I found out later that, that man those managers are supposed to ask you that one important question. What are you buying the gift cards for? Did somebody ask you for them? And that's supposed to, I was at a very vulnerable time when it happened, and it didn't even dawn on me. And um, the question is, you know, are you getting them for someone, or are you buying them for family? It didn't even dawn on me. If they had asked me that question, I would have stopped. It would have clicked in my head, and I would have stopped and not done it. Um, so that just fails out the, you know, 500 bucks. But, um, you know, this person still contacted me for I don't know how many months under as my friend. And I was like, what are you doing to me? And I don't need to talk to this person anymore. And uh, I was getting texts and photos and all this from them portraying supposedly what was going on, you know. And after time, I still have it on my phone, after time, her name disappeared, and now it's got someone else's name on it. Yeah, so 
I do know that retailers are now training their front end employees as well as management to, to, be, to, to be on the lookout for stuff like that. Yeah. And they will ask. One of the issues is when people are there buying those cards, they're doing it for what they think is an urgent reason. Right. So even if they're asked that question, um, they're more likely to either give a reason that they know will allow the transaction to continue. Right, because the manager had to do, for me, had to do three transactions to get that process done. She did two, and then she did two more. So, you know, it gives you time for the, for, for the minute to just to say, are you sure you're doing this for the right reason? You know? Yeah, yeah, and, and I get it. But, but you know? as, as long as the customer is answer, yeah. answering that question and saying, yeah, I know, I know why I'm buying this, it's legitimate. Right then the transaction is going to continue, unfortunately. Even though the manager <coughs> or employee at the register may sense that something is wrong, yeah. there's really nothing they can do at that point to stop it. Right, I know they can't stop it, but that would at least put in our minds, oh, wait a minute, what am I doing? Something's not right. Yes, I, I agree with that. I agree with you 100%. And I would have gladly given my kid the first time <coughs> that I had spent. Sure. You know, instead of letting someone else get it. I understand. And, and that's what they do. So so you were getting the messages or phone calls from a number that you knew as a, a friend yeah, of yours. Friend that I had so yeah. more, more likely than not, what happened in that situation is your friend's information was compromised. Right. They were able to go through that person's phone probably see that you were a frequent contact maybe you guys shared photos and that's how they do it that's how they pull it off right yeah and, and so caller IDs can be changed see, I didn't uh, know that. you can put anything on a caller ID nowadays also to make it simple and, and sorry I'm not using the microphone hopefully I can broadcast well to make it very simple do not ever pay anybody in those cards gift cards that uh, I still don't understand like I, it's a great way for them to get money to scam people out of money including myself but do not ever ever buy a gift card and give that number over the phone um, we if it's an emergency and you think something else is going on give us a call slow things down that's a big thing that you can do I, I know when you hear emergency you hear grandson grandchild in jail when you hear uh, grandchild in the hospital needs money to get out of the hospital, slow things down. Take a quick moment, take a breath, call a relative, call that person directly. Do something else so you can protect yourself and your money. That's the big thing. Any other questions? Go ahead. Well, I've been getting some, some letters from something called Home Protect Warranty Division, time sensitive. And it says, this is going to inform you that your property's home warranty and where I live, secured by Westboro Savings Bank, may be expiring. Our records indicate that you have not contacted us to get your home warranty updated. I keep getting these letters, and now I'm getting checks for $199 that they want me to cash. And this seems to have started about a year to the day that my husband passed away. And Westboro Savings Bank isn't even. Yeah, there's no such. No, So for those. I got one this week. Another one. For those who didn't uh, catch what she was saying, she said that she's been getting letters in the mail saying that her home warranty is up from Westboro Savings Bank. The first thing I want to mention is: Is there a Westboro Savings Bank? No more. No more. Exactly. So I would just throw them out. That's it. And shred them because it has some personal information on there. That's another thing we wanted to add. Anything, any documents with personal information on it, make sure you shred them or either rip them up or throw them in your recycling because sometimes that's how people are able to obtain your information. Especially with the checks for $199. Right. They want me to cash. Right. right. Yeah, no. And uh, just make sure, you, make sure you shred them and get rid of them. So, no problem. Any other questions? What? Can you speak a little bit about the, the Medicare scam? 
the Medicare scam? Yeah, which is non, because the, the, the first officer spoke about uh, the computer virus thing. Yep. That's actually gone mostly away because most, pretty much every computer now has got its own built-in virus protection, so it doesn't really work. But I probably get between 10 and 20 between cell phone and home phone number calls a day um, about a Medicare uh, verification source. And it's been going on, and, and it's funny because uh, my adult grown children who are not on Medicare get them, I get them. Uh, now I'm getting them from my uh, deceased wife, which I think is even weirder because that, how, you know, why would they bother doing that? So, right. And the phone numbers are all, 99% are all uh, 774, which is a cell phone number. Right. Um, a lot of them are from the South Shore and the Cape. Um, but in the last two, three weeks, they're coming from Framingham, Hopkinton, and Westboro. Right. And uh, what I want to touch on as far as the Medicare scam, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. So as far as Medicare goes and that with a lot of other health insurance places, like I said earlier, those companies aren't going to do business over the phone either. Usually it's going to be a letter in the mail or something like that to notify you of any changes or anything like that or if they want you to sign up for new whatever they have. So as far as Medicare goes, very rarely are they going to do anything over the phone ever, just, just like the government. So if you get anyone who calls saying they're from Medicare or something like that, just hang up on them. There's no penalty for hanging up on anyone. Um, but, so as far as that goes, just don't answer the phone. Any other questions? I got something supposedly from Best Buy. From Best Buy? From Best Buy. Uh, advising me that my uh, Geek Squad renewal has occurred for a two year period. And my, uh, it's $199 and the goal is coming. Have you ever had a Geek Squad account? Years ago. I years think. ago. Years ago, I did. Uh, so, I sent a message back and said I did that order this and I sent me an invoice and I got uh, this, uh, they couldn't reach uh, that particular email. Right. So what I was wondering, you don't know when you get these things on your phone if they're really a legitimate thing. I'm sure it said Best Buy, but I'm sure maybe that wasn't there, was it truly the Best Buy, but somebody else was trying to do something. Right. So how do you... How can you identify those things before you actually pick them up? So, I, I mean, and what, what's the ramifications? I mean, I didn't give them any information. I tried to answer it. And if it had been a legitimate thing, I would have hoped that I would have gotten a response. Right. So as far as something like that goes, there's a few questions you have to ask yourself. First off, have you ever dealt business with Best Buy? Well, I did, like six years ago. Six years ago. Computer. And did you sign up with an account with them? And the next question is, if you do think it might not be Best Buy, one of the best ways to do is look up a phone number for Best Buy, contact them yourself, talk to the Geek Squad, see if they have anything about it. Or you can go to a Best Buy yourself, ask for them there, anything, and ask them in person, hey, did, is this from you? Uh, and if that came over an email, a lot of times they disguise their emails. So it'll say Best Buy Inc. or something. But if you click on that, so if you see it says Best Buy Inc. and you click on the email, you can see what the actual email address is. Mm -hmm. and most of the time it's going to be like a Gmail account or something. It's Best perfect. Buy is not doing business with Gmail, that's for sure. They have their own, they have their own uh, thing that they pay for, so they're not going to be making accounts on Gmail. So that those are probably the best ways for that. Probably have time for one more question. So, any, anyone else have any questions? This is maybe a little bit unusual, but I'm on the staff of the Congregational Church, and for every minister we've had in the past uh, 12 years, I always get something saying, oh, I'm really busy at meeting right now. Could you help me out? Because my minister is supposed to be talking to me, okay? Yep. Same thing, gift bikes and five cards for Looney Tunes or whatever, you know what I mean? And the first time I, I almost did it, but I thought, no, it doesn't really sound like her. Right. You know, so. And so now I'm, when I get stuff like that, I just get rid of it. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's just, you know, think, <laughs> my phone, off, very often, if it's an unknown number to me, will tell me possibly scan. 
Yeah. So that's really great because it does make, I figure, well, I'm going to let it ring, you know, go to voicemail. It's really legitimate. They'll leave me a message that they never do. So. That, that's a very good point you brought up, and I want to tell one quick, kind of funny story about that. Is, so what she mentioned is she's with the Congregational Church. Sometimes she'll receive messages saying, hey, it's the minister, and they'll give the name, and they'll say, hey, I need your help now. And then when you answer, that's when they'll tell you to go buy gift cards and stuff. So through our department, we've got emails from our chief of police saying, hey, Andrew, I need a quick favor. Yeah. And we get those emails too, like it happens to everyone. And there was one time where he sent it, and I emailed him back saying, hey, what do you need to? But then an email came out later saying, nope, that wasn't me, we got hacked. So lesson learned for me. Right. However, um, like I said, they do it to everyone. And the best way to try and avoid that is if you get a call from someone saying, hey, the boss and your friend or something like that, reach out to them directly. You don't want to hear it from a third party or anything like that. Re reach out to them directly. Ask them, hey, did you really need my help? Go and do it now or something like that. Or if you have any questions about it at all, call us and we can give you advice as well. And we can say, hey, this is probably a scam. No, it's probably not a scam. Lead you in whatever direction you want. So if there ever is doubt, you can call the station and speak with one of us about that. So just to wrap things up, um, I just found out through a party to my left that they're offering a shredding service on April 24th, 10 to 1, uh, 10 to 1. And I said, well, what kind of shredding service? They can still bring like a little folder. I was told you could bring, bring dump trucks full of stuff here, huge dump trucks to clean out the house. But if you have old unwanted papers with any sort of identification information on it, Bring it here on the 24th, 10 o'clock. Uh, really, a couple, what do you think, a couple boxes full? It's okay. Whatever we need to get rid of. Wow. Well, uh, whatever we're you need to get rid of. We're also taking pill, expired old medication, and sharps. So, wow. so there you go. Multi clean up day. A big clean up day. A spring cleaning day for everybody. Well, thank you so much for having us. I'm going to turn it over to Officer Sabati now. So he'll talk to you a little bit about some exciting stuff on police work. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate your time up here. Good morning. I saw uh, some familiar faces, and I was uh, introduced myself. Uh, my name is Officer Joseph Body. I'm one of the patrol officers here in town. Um, I well, kind of wear a few different hats. Uh, Elder Services Liaison. I'm on part of our community engagement team. I do defensive tactics. I'm a state certified instructor for that. Uh, that's kind of what led me today to uh, this little presentation today. Um, it's called Duty to Intervene. I'm also a state certified instructor with that as well. Let's see if I can get the monitor. It's a little PowerPoint presentation and a little video. Bear with me. It was maybe, yes, no, maybe so. Yeah, yeah. It's going to warm up for a second. So. Um, let me start off with this. This program is called Duty to Intervene. And can anyone tell me, on their own kind of words, what that might be? The question is, duty to intervene for law enforcement. Your own perspective. Anybody want to just tell me what you think that will, what that means? Good. Having a problem at home with one of your grandkids or children or anybody at home, and you want some help in it, yes, please come in and help you out. Sure, that that could be one way. Yep. Um, how it affects us here in law enforcement is actually how police officers have to handle themselves. Um, and I'm going to just show you a quick little PowerPoint presentation, just a few slides, and a little video, which I think um, two little videos at the end, if I can get them up and running, kind of show good uses of ways police officers are going to do this. So maybe we'll see. Bear with me, I'm not the most uh, technically advanced uh, individual. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So let's see if I can get this. Uh, sometimes I have a wireless mouse to help me out, but if not, oh, there you go. so I might have to be up here. I try to, sometimes I walk around a little bit, but our opening statement, all right? So our goal is to provide officers 
police officers ourselves, all right? The legal standards and general concepts regarding their duty to intervene. Officers must stop unlawful resistance quickly. And officers and um, use of force is a seizure under the Fourth Amendment under our Constitution. And officers must adhere to legal standards, agency policies, and procedural justice when they use uh, force. And the big thing here is that officers who witness another officer using excessive force is in violation of the law or policy and has a duty to intervene and stop the excessive force. So, let's talk about force. Now, I'm going to try this. No, it still hasn't worked. I've been, uh, I've been trying to teleport everybody to a nice tropical island with uh, a little... <laughs> With a little umbrella drinks, and uh, I haven't mastered it yet, so, but maybe he will. Well, let's talk about force real quick. Uh, the force is the amount of physical force, however slight, required by police to compel and co for compliance for an unwilling individual. And that stems from, in Massachusetts, it's 550 CMR 6.03. That is the law here in Massachusetts which police officers have to use force for people. Again, force, all right, is to uh, create a lawful arrest or detention of a person, prevent the escape of custody, prevent imminent harm, and the amount of force is used to pro uh, proportionate to the threat of imminent harm, or protecting the safety of officers and or others, and defend against individuals who initiate force against them. So again, as people who may see, like if your people are under arrest, or I might have to escort somebody out of, say if somebody gets a little wild here at the senior center, and they say, oh, hey, he needs to go. Can I help them, escort them out of the building? Yes, by, by law, I can. I can use the amount of force to resolve that issue. Other forms of use of force, excuse me. Pepper spray. Normally, when I'm on duty, I have a full duty belt. Today, I'm just kind of giving a presentation, but pepper spray, taser, my firearm, these are all things of, of force that I can use dealing with the situation. Again, pointing a firearm or a taser at someone, that is a show of force. All right, hopefully they will comply with those things. Okay, force is not though physically escorting or handcuffing the individual with minimal or no resistance. Okay, so some people say, oh, you're using, you know, if I'm escorting somebody out of the building or putting poison in the handcuffs under being under arrest, that's not a use of force. A big thing now in Massachusetts here is you probably have heard about chokeholds. Um, that all stemmed, I think, from we've never taught chokeholds here in Massachusetts. I'll tell you that as an instructor, all right, for defense in Texas, we've never taught that in any police academy in Massachusetts. Okay. I think a lot of that kind of misunderception got, um, came from an incident uh, in Minneapolis, about 1,300 miles away from here, um, almost three years ago, um, and the use of that. So, but an officer now is by law under the post standards, what Chief talked about, um, we are becoming credited as well, but under the post standards, police officer standards and training, chokeholds are illegal here in Massachusetts, and now it's not a law. Okay, so any, and every officer has been taught this. This program comes directly from the MPTC, which is the training council here in Massachusetts. Every single officer this year during the in-service training as part of their curriculum is getting this program. So we're telling every, every officer, do not do chokeholds. It's against the law. Don't even think about it, and or you will not be a police officer going forward. So that's just one thing of, of a use of force that we're not allowed to do. But again, Using force, we try to de-escalate things before we even have to use force. A lot of times, just by talking to someone, you can talk to somebody about, okay, listen, this is, we want to resolve this issue, how can we do it you know, amicably? And a lot of times, just by talking to someone, you can de-escalate things very easily. We give warnings, uh, we slow down the pace of incidents, waiting out a person, there's a lot of times, there's, there's no need to rush on things. If this is an immediate harm, then yes, but if we can weak things out and talk to somebody or create a plan of action, a lot of times, time's on your side. Creating distance between the officer and the threat and requesting additional resources to resolve the incident. Whether or not it be um, a barricaded subject, I might wait myself out and call our SWAT team, or let's say if we have a, 
um, person who is in the woods that might call for a canine or something like that, those are additional resources that we can use. So let's just talk about the duty to intervene. Okay, law enforcement is what it is. It's a law enforcement officer's present and observing another police officer using or attempting to use physical force, including deadly force, beyond what is necessary, say beyond, all right? What is necessary to objectively, reasonably based on the totality of the circumstances shall intervene to prevent the observed officer's use of, of unnecessary or unreasonable force, regardless of the rank of the officer so involved, unless intervening would result in immediate harm to the officer or an identifiable individual. And failure to intervene may result in decertification. So in a nutshell, what that is telling you is that as a police officer here, and I'm in a situation, and I see another officer going above and beyond what needs to be done, I am legally required to intervene and stop that officer from creating the excess force. It could be the chief of police. If he was doing something that I observed that is not appropriate and is going above and beyond, it's my duty as a police officer to stop him, just regardless of rank. A rookie officer could stop a sergeant. A supervisor could stop me if I was doing something different, wrong. Okay, so it's regardless of rank that we have to intervene. This is our Westboro Police Department verbatim policy that I am uh, regards to. It's, on, it's under our use of force policy the duty to intervene. All officers of the Westboro Police Department should be aware of their personal responsibilities during the use of force encounters. Officers shall have an affirmative duty to intervene should they observe a situation in which they perceive more than the necessary use of force being deployed by a fellow officer. All officers shall receive initial training upon hire as part of their field training program, which I am a field training officer, so rookie officers that come out of the police academy, they ride with me for almost three months and I teach them all kinds of different things, and this is one thing I, I go over very often with them. If he, was, or she, he or she was brand new and see me doing something wrong, they have that duty to intervene. Again, they have a law enforcement officer present and observing another officer using or attempting to use physical force, including deadly force, beyond which is necessary, or objectionably reasonable based on the totality of the circumstances, shall intervene to proceed the observed officers use nest unnecessary or unreasonable force, regardless of the rank, unless intervening would result in immediate harm to the officer or other independent individual. The failure of a law enforcement officer to intervene as set forth by, like we talked about, 550 CMR 605, may be subject to the officer's decertification by the commission, which is the post standards now. In addition, the failure to intervene may be subject to disciplinary action, civil liability, and or criminal prosecution. And I'll talk about criminal prosecution kind of later on in my presentation. So again, this is directly that every officer in Westboro has this. We sign off with that you read this. These are this is exactly our policy in Westboro. So that's coming from our, um, I know the chief talked about putting our policies and uh, some things up online, being transparent with everybody. That's exactly what I have. So just for everybody to kind of see and for those viewers at home. So that's what our policy here is in Westboro. I'm gonna talk about Commonwealth versus Adams just for a moment. This case happened back in 1989, but the decision came back out in uh, 1993. So as you just kind of know, you think about duty intervening in Minneapolis, and that was literally three years ago in, 2000, uh, in 2020. This actually case here in Massachusetts is in, in 1993. So we've had a duty to intervene all the way back then. So Massachusetts has kind of been a, on the forefront of things. And I'm just going to give you kind of the highlights of the case. So on, on May 12th, 1998, a gentleman named John Smith, he was in the Fenway area um, of Boston. As he drove away, um, he was followed by uh, two police officers and a uh, Mark's cruiser. And when they saw Officer Smith drive through a red light, a pursuit began. And as they, he continued to drive along, 
He continued more tra traffic offenses, but he always followed the speed limit. So he wasn't speeding. He did commit some traffic enforcement. Okay. He then got onto the Mass Pike. He started swerving at officers. Two more cruisers joined the chase. Okay. He continued through the. You remember the old tow booths on the Mass Pike? Yes. Yeah. Well, I do. I remember. I, even, I remember throwing the coins in the bucket. You know, a long, long time ago. But as he got kind of through the Austin Brighton area, all right, his cruiser, um, his car stopped. Okay. At that time, there were eight cruisers in pursuit of him. Okay. We're doing some minor traffic violations. Okay. There were eight armed officers uh, within 10 feet of uh, 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 John Smith's car, all close enough to hear and see what he was doing. The original officers approached his vehicle. All right. He, they, he was uh, sitting quietly and alone in his unlocked car. And that's kind of important to know. The officers asked him to get out of the car. Can you kind of maybe see the officer's mindset at this point? So failure to stop, not listening to directions. Now there's eight of them to that matter. Okay. What did John Smith do? He ended up lying down in his seat. Not resisting any officers, just not listening, but he laid down in his seat. So the officers then broke, uh, broke the driver's side and the passenger side window, gave him, continued to give him orders, and when he didn't follow those, they pulled John Smith through the window, instead of going through the open, unlocked door. Okay? Um, at that point, every officer became aware that, officer, uh, that John Smith was unarmed and completely under police control. They threw John Smith down the ground, and back then, it was one officer, then another officer, then an officer right on top of John Smith. Okay? So, as other two officers joined the pile, by then, John Smith was handcuffed behind his back, left face down. Um, when he tried to get up, an officer would kind of put his foot on his back and try to pin him to the ground. Um, at no point did any officer make any attempt or effort to stop or object of how John Smith was being treated by certain officers. So, certain, a couple officers were doing those actions, but there are eight total there, and none of them intervened. Okay. The Attorney General brought suit against the 13 officers uh, for violating Massachusetts civil rights, and they were found guilty of, by not, uh, basically by not interfering, uh, not doing their duty to stop those actions by certain police officers. So that's the Commonwealth of Adams case in 1993. And that's how a duty intervened came here in Massachusetts by law. Any questions so far? What was their punishment? Their punishment. The courts found that um, they actually went to federal court for civil rights violations on that matter, and they were found guilty of those things. They were found uh, guilty for excessive use of force um, and civil rights violations of those officers. What was the consequence that would mean? Oh, what was the, uh, what was the punishment for them? Yes, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't have what exactly what the exact punishments were of those officers. Pretty safe to say they're not working anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Tell people what qualified immunity is and when are we going to get rid of that? Uh, so qualified immunity for police officers is basically when under your, if you're doing, officers have the right to enforce the laws, and when they go above and beyond that, that's when qualified immunity will be um, taken away from them. So for some, for some matters, police officers can you know, make arrests um, under, the, under the color of law, and they're doing their, the right thing um, under their jurisdiction, but when they cross that line, then they don't qualify for basically being protected or lawsuits, and that's what qualified, kind of the general law, of, the general saying uh, qualified immunity is. It means they don't get prosecuted for doing the same things that one person would do to another person. That's what it means, right? More or less, yes. Okay, thank you. Cool. So what's the impact of intervention? All right? It's to prevent of misuse of force, save lives of officers and individuals, promotes officer wellness, or reduces the legal risk of, to officers and agencies. It strengthens our community trust, 
and enhances transparency, accountability, and reduces racial disparities. So again, we're trying to be more transparent and more enforcement, tell you kind of what's going on, what our policies are, and what our job entails. So some key findings through this thing, 72 out of the 100 largest police officers departments in the community have a duty to intervene requirement. And again, we've had this for many, many years. And 84% of police officers across the United States believe that officers should be required to intervene when they think another officer is being used. It's the right thing to do. You know, it really is. It, you have to take account of that. You're here to help people. That's, that's the number one part of your job. And what does intervention look like? It's called active bystanding or upstanding. And it's mostly looking to encourage uh, and by modeling peers and supervisors. Now, if I can get this to work, there are two short videos. The first one's about two and a half minutes. It's from Sunrise, Florida. Let's see if I can, if it will open up for me. YouTube, you have to uh, bear you with me. Must for, uh, stand up, or she will destroy us all. Your so this first video is out of Sunrise, Florida. Play the open and, uh, beta. It's a great use of you should um, use of how to do the interview. Nope, hold on. Oh my goodness, I can't move on to let go. It's playing on my screen. I'm not going to keep you too long, but and I apologize for uh, not showing this. But I will give you the kind of the reader's digest of uh, what happened. I wish I could uh, see the duty of intervene. It's actually very good by a, a rookie officer. It's ridiculous. Due to my technical abilities, I'm not going to be able to, uh, unfortunately, show that to you. Um, what it is, is actually, I'll give you the reader's digest. Um, an individual was being arrested. He was uh, resisting going back to the police car. There were five officers uh, trying to assist that individual trying to get into the police car. Um, this sunrise sergeant um, comes over. He's one of the last ones to arrive on scene, and um, in a nutshell, he is probably about a little taller than me, and about two or three times wider and muscular, and um, he opens up the cruiser door, and using some selective words, he basically tells uh, the person under arrest who's in handcuffs in the back of the car, he's gonna rip his soul from his body. Um, he has his pepper spray out, he threatens them, um, and 
what he does and what a rookie also does, she is both um, much smaller. Um, she actually grabs on the back of his duty belt and actually pulls him from the back of the police car and away from the suspect um, to try to intervene. The sergeant actually then turns and grabs the fellow officer by the, the throat and pushes her against the police car um, and tells her, you know, don't ever touch me again, I'll see you in a, in a, in a little bit in his office. Um, that sergeant is a former sergeant of the Sunrise Police, uh, Police Department and he was actually criminally charged um, by assaulting the fellow officer. Um, and he is actually uh, awaiting trial. And, um, he's got, his charges are um, felony battery, assault on law enforcement, um, assault on the prisoner who's in the back. Um, so he's no longer a police officer, um, just for his actions. So like I said, he was so fired up. There were, like I said, five or six other officers already on scene. Um, some people said, hey, you don't need to do this. And he went above and beyond and went and did that to that action. Um, so he is a former police officer, so it does happen. Uh, there was a second video of LAPD that I was gonna try to show you. Um, again, an individual was being arrested and one officer went to go. Um, the person being arrested ends up, they're on the kind of playing on the kind of a little bit of slight hill on the sidewalk and the suspect um, ends up kicking one of the Police officers kind of in the leg as in, as they're kind of being arrested. She's up there already in handcuffs, and the and one officer went to go and punch a person, um, and a second officer like literally blocked his arm from striking the suspect and said, "No, that's not enough. That's not, that's not right. Let's back up and get away." So we actually did the right thing for for, for an officer, you know, creating more um, force and that's very reasonable. So those are the two videos I was going to show you, but obviously I'm not. Uh, not the most tech savvy person, but I wish we could show. But are there any questions on kind of duty intervene on what police officers actually need to be? Yes, I do have one. Good. The most annoying thing that a police officer can do, in my personal opinion, is shoot the family dog. Because he's bow wow wow wow. You, you must have heard about this. This is new to the world, right? How uh, about intervening on behalf of the family dog? Because, you know, that's like a member of the family. I don't know if you have a dog, but if somebody shot my dog, that's a problem. Okay. It's going to be a problem for them. So why do we have to shoot the family dog because he's going bow wow 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 wow? I don't I don't know how the uh, the correct answer to answer that is. Um, I, I, I don't I don't have a dog. Um, I, and I know people who go they they have animals and pets. They are just like family. Um, but again, it's what the officer's personal interactions or perceptions are of that dog. Are they attacking them? I, I don't. I don't know. I'm not in that situation, um, so I, I can't answer that. You know, to give you the correct very answer. It's sensitive for a lot of people. They never get over it. I, I can imagine. So you're welcome. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. question was, you know, officers, you know, during their course of interactions, you know, people uh, can be, you know, spit on or, or bit or attacked and so like that. That is true. And, um, I know the chief had talked about, we actually have body cameras here now in Westboro. Uh, they've been uh, implemented for over a little over a year now, and they've been a great tool um, to basically show the, the viewpoint of the police officers and what that other person's interaction may be and what the uh, officers, you know, mindset of things and how they're processing things. They've been a great tool here in Westboro, um, and it kind of shows kind of everything that's happened before, the information that uh, officers are kind of processing in their mind, the information, what a suspect or a situation is presenting to themselves, and how I'm going to react to those things. So it, it definitely helps having the body cameras here in Westboro, and it kind of show that why why I might have done that. It's like, well, this is what I saw, this is kind of what I heard, and kind of the camera kind of you know confirms those things as well. Really? Yes, questions? Well, my concern is that there were, there were some 
for policemen shouldn't be policemen. Absolutely. And I agree that they should not be policemen. However, I'm very concerned about policemen because there's been so much bad news sure. forecast us. And let's say you had you or against somebody who was high on drugs and their adrenaline is caught. One guy's trying to hold them down and maybe the second guy doesn't know if you can hold them down or not. You're at the disadvantage. Sure. Not the person who's high on drugs that doesn't have a clue what's going on. Yeah, you know, and the question was, you know, are there some uh, other law enforcement officers, you know, in, you know, that have the job and that should be? And yeah, there are. You know, um, we've been fortunate enough to um, go through a great hiring process here in Westboro, and we've had people that we've, you know, we've looked at and we're like, you know what, they're not going to be a good fit here in Westboro. You know, and that's and the chief has said, I'd rather not have a, you know, an officer that's not going to be a good fit than hire them just to help out and make numbers and you know fill shifts. He goes, I'd rather, you know, not have that issue. So she's been really good about the hiring process. Um, but as we know, there, there's always a little bad apple in the bunch. And I tell people, you know, are there, um, you know, other, other professions that have, you know, that might people don't have, you know, doctors, dentists, lawyers. I mean, everybody has that small percentage of, you know, individuals who may not be the right fit for that profession. So, anything else? Yes, sir. The most of the most, uh, 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 how do I put it, the, uh, the most uh, effective means of getting someone to do something is uh, the, the uh, uh, a potential to sue them. Now, if a police officer uses excessive force against an individual and uh, they take him to court and they sue him, they can collect a, a judgment, correct? We're right, I'm right about that, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, what if a police officer uses excessive force against an individual and the other police officers do not intervene. Can you sue them also? Yeah, so basically, um, through this training, basically every, every officer who's on that scene is liable for that situation. So if if I'm the officer um, and, I, and I have a fellow officer who's doing something wrong and I don't intervene, I'm liable. Even though you don't do it, even, even though if I don't, don't do anything, anything yes, that's the whole kind of premise of this training is that I'm responsible for, everybody's responsible for everybody. Um, and law enforcement. So I can't just be a, a, a bystander and stand there or turn my back and pretend that's not, didn't happen. I'm there, if I see something or hear something, I'm legally required to intervene. And, so, and if I don't, then I'd be liable for a potential lawsuit. Good. <clears throat> Questions, concerns, anything else? I have one quick announcement. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. I'm sorry that we uh, weren't able to see the videos, but you might be uh, seeing my smiling face maybe again for another presentation, hopefully. And uh, if you don't, I'll be around town, usually in just a different uniform and uh, some other community events. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.